You see, there are those who remain enslaved by the outer, by the outer forces, by the outer situations, by the outer voices. And worse than them are those who start believing in the inner. There are those who are compelled by forces outside of themselves. And then there are those who say we are impelled by forces inside of ourselves. These two are not different. In fact, the latter is even more deeply self-deceived than the former. What is this outer and inner? Reading a few texts in spirituality, very quickly you come to the conclusion that all outer is just a mirage. And if outer is a mirage, what do you say of the inner? Does the inner exist without the outer? If the outer is gone, what is the question of the inner? What is this thing called inner? Where does it exist? Soul inside what? What do you mean by inner? Hmm? In? In what? When you say something is in something, then you mean it is enveloped. Then you mean it is enclosed. So the soul is inside the body. Then how is the inner any false? Because the body thrives on the outer. When you say the soul is in the body and at the same time you want to decry the outer, then tell me how is the outer false? Because the body feeds on the outer. Remove the outer, would the body exist? No. So, look at what you are saying. The soul, which you call as a supreme truth, lives inside the body and the body feeds on the soil, the grass, the sun and the air. So the soul too by definition lives on these, right? Yes. Because the body is so big that it contains the soul. And if the body lives on soil and grass, then the soul too must be feeding on these. If the body is dependent on soil and grass, then the soul too has to be dependent. No, it is not dependent. If it is not dependent, then it must be able to live without the body. What is it doing inside the body? The body is always a dimension. The body is always a happening, temporal. The body is in space and time. And by saying that the soul is inside the body, you have located the soul too in space and time. Without? That is very good. The body cannot discharge its functions without the soul, without the truth. Alright? How does that mean that the truth is inside the body? If it pervades all over, why are you calling it inside the body? Why don't you say it is upon the table? Don't you see the deep ego contained in that? I am so great that I envelop the Atman. My measure is of a dimension that can encircle the truth itself. If the truth is somewhere inside your body, then where will you bow down? What then is the need of bowing down? I am carrying it in my back pocket. 
I am carrying it in my kidney, I am carrying it in my nostrils. Now what is the question of submitting? Neither inside nor outside. Inside and outside exist only as long as you are looking with your eyes. For 8 to 10 hours in the day, where do these inside and outside disappear? Are they real? Please. What happens to all inside and outside? In your sleep, what will happen to them after the body is gone? Who is this one talking of the boundaries and the insides and outsides of the boundary? This is one of the deepest fallacies that religion has bred, that the soul is inside the body. And this has led to mass illusion and great suffering. On one hand you say I am not the body. On the other hand you say inside the body is the truth. Don't you say what that implies? If you say in the same breath that you are not the body and then you also say that the truth is inside the body then what are you essentially saying? You are saying I am not the truth. And it's not about any one line of thought or any one philosophy. Across religions Across thoughts and ages, this belief holds sway. Just to add up to that question, you know, uh, many of the time people say that you know we are going for a meditation just to you know, uh, to know find our inner self or something. Isn't that something that you know whenever we are meditating somewhere, our preconditioned mind is answering to the questions that we have? In of course, all these things, inner self, inner voice, inner reality, all of them are just illusions and because they have come in <coughs> circulation, they have taken the form of mass hysteria. Everyone wants, everyone wants to dig out something from his insides. We don't even look at the facts of living. Don't you see that this that you call as inner always speaks in a language that you have acquired? Has your inner voice ever spoken to you in French, in Russian? Has it? Has it ever spoken to you in your deep dreamless sleep? Huh? Don't you see that it only tells you that which you are anyway conditioned to do. Don't you see that your deepest conditioning speaks in the form of this so-called inner voice or inner reality? And that is why I am saying that this concept of an inner truth has done mankind great damage. It has enabled man to justify all his rubbish in the name of the voice of conscience or the voice of inner truth.
justify not so much to others, but firstly justify to himself. Why do you need to look at facts? Why do you need to be present? When an inner voice can come up with solutions. Why do you need to know by attending to the reality when a substitute for reality is assumed to be present inside you? Spirituality says uh, like you have to find yourself, finding yourself. So, sir, as you are saying that there is no soul inside us, and then what are we finding inside? Means spirituality is not at all not at all about finding something inside of you. Who said that? Show me where it is said that you have to find something inside of you. What are these? popular illusions. Spirituality is simply silence. The Upanishads say, and they put it so beautifully, that which powers the mind to think is that which the mind cannot think of. That which powers the tongue to speak is that which the tongue cannot speak of. That which powers the ears to hear is that which the ears cannot hear of. You don't need to go inside the body. The body itself is the proof and that. In another instance, the Upanishads say, the ear behind the ears, the eye behind the eyes, the voice behind the voice, the mind behind the mind. Looking at the mind, you require the mind behind the mind. Seeing how you hear, you have started listening. Shrutrasya Shrutram The ear of the ear That does not mean that there is another ear inside your ear That does not mean that there are eyes inside the eyes and after them, behind them is some soul What kind of model making is this? Have you read no biology? <laughs> I think a basic course in anatomy is a prerequisite to basic spirituality. Before you touch the Upanishads, you must first go through a textbook on human anatomy so that there remains no confusion regarding any vacancies or yeah, vacant spots inside the body where the soul can take refuge. So people have gone on to conduct very clever experiments. Actually there is a verse in the Kat Upanishad where it is said that the Atman is of the size of a thumb. People have taken that literally and they have started and gone to great lengths in trying to find out where that pocket is, where this thumb-shaped cavity is there. Then there were others who objected, particularly the Buddhists and the Jains. They said, if the Upanishads are right, then tell me, where is the thumb-sized cavity inside the body of an ant. The ant is so small. So then came another clever reply that in the case of the ant, the thumb refers to the ant's thumb. <laughs> After all, the soul is supposed to be inside the body. 
ノンセンス。But then the <coughs> Vedantis were not to be left far behind. They said, How about the fish? They have no thumb. What is the size of their soul? If so, what is said from a position of meditation must be understood in the same meditative way. When it is said that the soul is of the size of a thumb. And inside of you, what is implied is that it is small. It is an idiom, it's, it's a way of saying, it's a metaphor. Like you say two pence when you are referring to a very small quantity. Don't you say that? Similarly, it was said it's of the size of a thumb because it was implied that it is not large, that it is not so large that you can look at it with admiration. It is not the size of a mountain, it is not something imposing, it is subtle. Hence, the metaphor of the thumb was used. Similarly, when it was asserted, and it comes in the Bhagavad Gita as well, Krishna does say that I live inside of you. When it was asserted, that the soul is inside the body. It was only to counter the feeling that the soul is outside the body. Inside has to be read as not outside. But when somebody is under the impression that the truth is outside of him, then it is even more dangerous for him to start believing next that the truth is inside of him. Because the inside and outside go together. If you start in the inside, you will also have to believe in the outside. Truth is neither inside nor outside. It is the basis of all insides and outsides. It is a substratum on which that mind rests which thinks of all insides and outsides. As they say, the Upanishads, the mind behind the mind, the mind underneath the mind. So, inside and outside are mind. The truth is that which is beneath both inside and outside. So, outsides, insides keep coming and going. The truth remains. Bodies keep coming and going. The Atman remains. Were you talking of any inside before you were born? Would you be talking of any outside after you are gone? Does that mean that the truth came with you and go away with you? Your insides and outsides will be washed away by time. The truth remains. <coughs> 